everybody, and welcome to another episode of Top Soccer Coach. Today, I have a really special guest, the first goalkeeping coach that we've ever had on the show, the, one of the top goalkeeper coaches in the entire country, Coach Mickey Cohen. And I'll just give you a little brief background on Coach Mickey. 1966 National Championship LIU against San Francisco. Coach Mickey Cohen was the goalkeeper. He was trained under Dr. Joe Machnick. He played professional soccer in the American Soccer League. And I'm going to have to get Coach Mick to confirm this, but I believe it was the, the Connecticut Yankees and maybe the Wildcats. And he's coached at LIU. I believe he's coached at Boys and Girls High School in Brooklyn. He was, he's been with Martin Luther King High School for 19 New York City championships. He's produced professional goalkeepers. He's coached with me at Monroe College. And I think one of the best things to do to introduce the audience to Coach Mick, when I tell you that Coach Mick is one of the best goalkeeper coaches in the country, I got three or four quick little tidbits I just want to give you about Coach Mick before he takes the show is I can remember with Coach Mick and I in 2000, oh Mick, I think it was 2011, in Arizona, right. we're playing a team from Iowa, Iowa Western, who was an excellent team loaded with Brazilian players. And we go to overtime and then we go to PKs. And, you know, that was early in my coaching career. And I was a little bit all over the place. And I look at Coach Mick and he's cool as a cucumber sitting there. And he's got notes that he took on every single player in the game. And by the way, they played he kind of wrote down what he thinks the tendencies for their penalty kicks were going to be. And he shared those with our goalkeeper, Gene Carlo at the time. And for me, I was like, that was coaching wisdom at the highest. I never thought of something like that. And then I can remember being, I want to say it was giant stadium at the time we were helping coach an all-star high school team. And Mick takes some grass into the air and throws it up and tells the keeper, this is the first thing you do. You want to see which way the wind is blowing so you can adjust your technique and adjust your positioning in the goal. And I said to myself, oh, that's, that's really interesting. And then we're again in the national championships in 2014 in Arizona. And he tells the goalkeeper, push the goal up an extra inch on these PKs and it's going to cut down the angle for the penalty kick taker. And what do you know? We win in, in, in penalty kick shootouts. And those are just some of the little stories. Mick, I wasn't going to tell him about the story about the laundry, how you would have your goalkeeper shirt custom made with bright colors because it attracts the eye of the shooter. This is what I call massive soccer coaching wisdom. So Coach Mick, welcome to the show. And I wanted to start out with asking you just to share with us how you got started in the game. And let's start back with the LIU experience with Dr. Joe Machnick. What can you tell us there? The 1966 LIU team, which is the only team in LIU that's the whole team is in the Hall of Fame. Mm. And I was not a goalkeeper. I was just a field player. In those days, freshmen could not play. So you sat out your freshman year. You only played sophomore, junior, and senior year. So the sophomore year, I was a field player, one of the only Americans. So an insight into how soccer is developed on LIU's team, which was all immigrant kids. Nice. And sophomore year, because of my attributes, which were nowhere on the level of Carlo Truman Totsi and Dove Marcus and uh, Johnny Limbaris, representing every country you can think of, Jamaica, Trinidad, and me from Brooklyn. Yeah. But I displayed the American characteristics of toughness, determination, grit, uh, physical abilities. You know, I, I would man-to-man -man Mark, which doesn't exist too much anymore, like one of the top players on the other team to take him out of the game. And I was the first sub. 
you know, I was the first, the 12th man on the LIU team. In those days, and I'm always going to go back to days because there's so much time that I cover in my career, mm. the, the traditional team was 16 players. That's it. You know, not like you have 24 today, 28, like Martin Luther King, sometimes the high school team, 16 players. That's it. Do you have an athletic trainer, Mick? We had very good athletic trainers. Good okay. question. <laughs> Some of my favorites. Yeah, they're Hall of Fame guys, every one of them. And I all remember their names. But the sophomore year, the 65 team was in the NCAA tournament. Mm. And the first round was against Army. Now, in those days, and people can all look this up, the teams that were the best teams, perennial champs, was St. Louis University, which is the home of American-based soccer players, American players. Oh, okay. Of course. Michigan State, Army, Navy. That's it. They were in the Final Four all the time. Okay. And St. Louis, as you know, has won like 11 national championships. Yeah. And most of them were when the championship started, which was yeah. maybe in the 60s, the national championship, NCAA. And the 65 team played up in Army, and we lost 3-2. to two. Mm. And after that game, we said, we were so much better. Mm. How could we lose to them? Because those teams, the military academy teams, were displaying ethic, tough, hard, in great physical shape, and a, a, a foreign player, you know, a player of a foreign background sprinkled in. Yeah. And that team had... First team All American, I'd call him by his his Lithuanian name, Iedris Leveka, Levechka, I call him, mm -hmm. Dr. Jerry. And he was an amazing player, right wing, outside right. Yeah. Okay, so now we go to the next year. Coach Macknick did not like the goalkeeper on 65 team. Okay. Which I have to present this. <laughs> you. Yeah. So he, he did not have a backup goalkeeper. He said, How yeah. do I get rid of this guy? <laughs> so Carlo Tron Totsi, who became the soccer coach at St. Francis, was there of Brooklyn 25 years, mm -hmm. uh, a master coach, was my teammate. He and Dr. Joe, Joe Matchnik, walking through the gym, watch Mickey, that was a baseball player, catching the pitchers. Mm. which was, you know, inside before the season started. And these guys are throwing high 80s, bouncing the ball, you know, which is very scary. Right, right, right. So they concocted, hey, Mickey can catch that little P. <laughs> Every catch a soccer ball, no problem. Yeah. So Joe took me away to summer camp. It's, it's like the Korean North Korean national team who they hit for three years training. <laughs> he takes me away and trains me every day, one on one training. And Joe, of course, is Dr. Joe, who's the rules expert, who the telecasters always call to uh, explain the, the rules, see for yeah. rules. And he began. The epitome of the top Mick, I lost you there for a second. Okay, so yeah. Joe took me away summer camp for two months and trained me with uh, a friend of his, Anatole Popovich. Mm. And every morning, six in the morning, we were out there. And you know Connecticut. This camp was in Connecticut. Yeah. And we were training and Connecticut always has the dew and the mist on the ground. Oh, yeah. And, you know, in the grass. And I would be in my sweatsuit, so I was carrying probably 8, 10, 12 extra pounds. Yeah. And that's the way I learned. And my protege, Buna Kandu, who was my first goalkeeper at uh, Martin Luther King Junior High School in 2000, who became a big-time pro with the uh, Red Bulls, captain of Senegal in Africa. And he would introduce me, and I didn't even think about it, 
my first year as goalkeeper, I was playing in the NCAA final, my first year. Mm. And of course, from Joe, I learned the basics of goalkeeping, which is technique, mm. catching the ball. That's what the laws give us. You use your hands. When the ball is in your hands, there's no danger anywhere else. Mm. And you catch the ball in your hands in a W shape with your hands behind the ball or in the basket. We like to call the basket the midsection catch or the bank. You know, when the ball is in that position, like about your waist level or your thigh or, or low, you know, you, you use the basket technique. And so I was drilled every day. This is the way you catch a ball, Mickey. This is the way you dive. This is uh, how you handle yourself in the goal. And not only that, which, of course, you don't see too much today because the game has changed so much, especially goalkeeping, mm -hmm. is the psychological aspect of goalkeeping. So as you know, when you build a foundation of soccer, it's the three pillars. You have your physical, you have your technique, and you have your tactics. And the fourth pillar holding the building up is the psychological aspect, which I respect you because you're always reading things about a psychiatrist developing uh, new Mick. thoughts and L let's be honest goalkeepers yeah. got to be tough and they got to be brave and they got to be courageous right yeah absolutely yeah if you if you don't have a little something going on with you it's hard to be a goalkeeper yeah. oh yeah and when you invited me here you know so many things were rolling through my head about you know, we're talking about me being involved in soccer since 1964. And Joe said goalkeeper has to do all of those things and be an intimidator. Mm. And I've always done that. Uh, the penalty area was my home. Mm. Anyone in there was an enemy. Mm. I was to be treated as such. Yeah, <laughs> you're making me nervous, man. They were not welcome in my area, trust me. And they yeah. paid the price. Yeah. You know, if uh, somebody did something wrong to me, and the next kind of airborne I came through, he was looking at my fists. And yeah. My arm. And uh, I always, when I speak to the kids, you know, and I coach the kids, there are many rules, you know, uh, principles in soccer, guiding basic, you know, your angle play, your this, your that, you control your penalty area. I said, but there's only one commandment, APY, always protect yourself. Mm. So that's what you do. I'm a safety first guy. So you have to learn the proper techniques of goalkeeping and always protect yourself because you're no good when you come out poorly and a guy kicks you in the in the face and you didn't protect your face while you were coming out and then you know you're injured you're out yeah mick listen it's funny you talk to us about you know that toughness right mm -hmm. and i when i was young i played in some of the leagues in in colt park and pope sure. park in 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 uh, hartford connecticut against you know the the the, the all the teams, all, yeah. all the teams in the Connecticut Absolutely. Soccer League and in the yeah. Dirt Bowls and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. And honestly, you have to be pretty tough. You yeah. did have to be pretty tough. Yeah. So back in the day, mm -hmm. people are going to find this hard to believe. And I was kind of – it was interesting to me. You played in the Laza League, correct? What is that? Well, in, in uh, Ludlow, Mass, sorry, they used to bring in players from <laughs> Portugal, right? <laughs> yeah. So tell me about like who you played in the in the in the Portuguese leagues down oh, in Massachusetts. Yeah. So he introduced me, my 1973. My first professional year was 1972 with a team called Northeast United, which is a whole story in itself, okay. and that was a great experience. 73, Benny Brewster and Hubert Vogelsinger, the great Yale coach, very well known, invited me to this team, Connecticut Wild. And I said, you know, the team I played for before was so nasty. They did some bad things. You know, I've been with soccer teams. They come, they go, they 
they fold. I don't know if I'm interested, you know. I go up there. It was a great experience. I, I love playing with the guys. Then the next year, Connecticut Wildcats folded, and the Connecticut Yankees came in. They were the only two. Mick, I think you're starting to fade in and out again. Oh, man. That's the better. First, the first professional sports team in Connecticut state history. The first yeah. professional sports team. Think mm. about that. First was professional sports team. And Eusebio had come, the great Eusebio, and Simois, teammates from Benfica, which probably played at five European Cup finals and won two or three of them. Mm. And so we're playing, I think Danny Gaspar was the goalkeeper mm. for that team. So they were doing these touring games for the Portuguese community so they can make money because, you know, you didn't make that much money in those days playing soccer. Interesting. And so I lined up facing the guys who I practiced with, Eusebio, I practiced with, with them at the Boston Minutemen, and his buddy, Antonio Chamois, who became an Indian coach here, you probably know him, he's coach here many years. And that was just thrilling. Yeah. And I was proud Eusebio scored on me. <laughs> and I'll tell you stories about Eusebio. So they took a corner kick from the, my right side, yeah. an outswinger by Simois, I would compare, and I hope I wouldn't upset either one of them, to David Villa. That's okay. the kind of player he was. He was a midfield genius for Benfica and Portugal. And he would be setting up, they were like, they played with this, each other so many years, it was like magic. So he takes the outswinger with his left foot, yeah. and Eusebio is running parallel to the goal line across the six to meet the head. So I come to cover my near post. Eusebio goes up in classic form. Heads the ball. As he's up there, pop, he twists, and that ball goes into the far side. <laughs> and I go, that's why he was Eusebio. So, Mick, what, what do you know? What, Like, to you in your mind, like, what's the difference between goalkeepers back in the day then and goalkeepers now. Like, I know that you didn't start off wearing gloves. and go I don't right. know when gloves came into right. style or whatever. Is there a difference with you know, learning without the gloves and keeping without gloves? And, you know, give me a little insight on that, in your opinion. That's a great question, B. The glove thing drives me nuts when I'm coaching the kids, you know? They take, like, six minutes to wrap those gloves on. You know, I go, like, you know what? You don't need gloves. <laughs> Play with your hands, man. Your hands are the piano keys, your fingers, the way you feel the ball, you gently caress the ball. And then when you put on gloves, you'll see it's, you know, you, you'll be so much more advanced. Yeah. But the reason, and, and you're right, I didn't wear gloves. When I played up in Connecticut. There were pictures of me. I, I was gloveless, no gloves. My hands were my bank. You know? What about in the freezing cold, Mick? No gloves. No Sorry. gloves. No Get gloves. it done. No gloves. Okay. So today, because the ball has been made so light with grooves in it, you know, to yeah. make it move, it's, you know, it, you need gloves. And plus, these guys shoot so hard. You know, it's dangerous for your fingers. And back in the old days with my buddy Shep Messing, when we played indoors in the MISL, mm -hmm. Major Indoor Soccer League, we used to wrap our fingers because, you know, playing indoors, the guys are so close, they're ripping those balls and your fingers are getting destroyed. When you're saying wrapping the fingers, it's almost like the equivalent of those finger save gloves now. Yes, which I'm not familiar with. I mean... I know what they are, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, it's funny. That's, you know, you, it was probably the same purpose, you wrapping your fingers compared to what these fingers. A lot of my goalkeepers never use the finger save gloves. They don't like them, but. Yeah. yeah. And, and the funny comment, you know, I'm a funny type of guy. I always say, okay, you wear these gloves, but the goalkeepers don't catch the ball anymore. <laughs> what good are these gloves? Yeah. Why don't they have gloves designed like the, 
and I always compare sports, the uh, ends in American football, who supposedly wear these gloves that like stick them. If the ball comes to those gloves, boom, they're stuck to their hands. <laughs> so, you know, like why the goalkeepers don't catch anymore? They carry everything. So, so you think that back in the back with Joe Matchnick, there was yes. more emphasis on catching the ball? <laughs> you know, in those days, one of the coaches' tactics was always, you know, we play the college teams, send in a cross to the goalkeeper and hammer him. <laughs> For the next cross, you know, he's going to be reluctant to come out. Yeah. <laughs> now, that, that was the way things were. Yeah. So, yes, uh, when you came for a ball, and I have a picture in my mind of me, what goalkeeper form was, was that what I just explained about Eusebio. You landed, you jumped off your plant left foot or right foot, mm -hmm. whichever would be appropriate. You extend your knee up, like taking a layup, and yeah. you tap that ball. When you do that, everybody yeah. goes, okay, this guy's confident. He's got hands, you yeah. know. And, and that's what I did. I didn't try to basket catch at all unless it was necessary. Mm. Because I catch the ball in the air and it's mine. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's intimidation and domination. Interesting, Mick. Mick, when you were when you were coaching, you mentioned Buna. When you were coaching Buna, who went on to obviously three African Nations Cups. And yes. so when you first get Buna. Yes. And people don't understand what this is. I mean, you're in New York City, and Boone is up from, you know, East Harlem or wherever he's from in there, and he comes, you know, to you uh, in some – it's not a regular field, right? It's a mini field. And yes. how do you get a kid like that? How do you know? Like, did you know that he was going to be that good? Uh, the, uh, you know, I've been uh, with you so many years, and this is why I love being with you. Of course, you know. With my experience playing with so many players, uh, Eusebio, Simois, Shep Messing, uh, Steve Zungle, the Lord of All Indoors, the New York Arrows, four straight championships, uh, Wolfgang Sunholz, you might know Wolfie, coaching academy. I can see a, a player just by looking at him, you know, in, in three minutes. And when I saw Buna, it was like, I was out of soccer for a while. It was like full circle, reborn. You know, yeah. to see a youngster like this with a physical talent, okay? His size, his flexibility, his power. Mm. And so that combined with dedication makes you a pro. Mick, how did it feel when... When you and I go to the Red Bulls and, and we're in the stands and Buna runs over to you and gives you his shirt and stuff, like how mm -hmm. does that how does that how does that relationship because I know that he's had you down to to his club and 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 has really taken you know given you the highest levels of respect and mm -hmm. uh, how do, how does that make you feel? Well, this is you know as a teacher, I'm a teacher. I taught history in. New York City public school system for 25 years, starting at Boys High in Central Brooklyn for 10 and mm -hmm. coaching the soccer team there, which was a total thrill of my life. Mm. And one thing teachers don't get is their students who move on. You never hear, you know, coach, I went to a, or, or graduated. You don't get that enough. Yeah. So with that, with Buna, that's the best. I mean, yeah. there's even no words to describe how related to be introduced by Buna to his professional team, New Amsterdam uh, Football Club. Yeah. And then he tells the stories about me. He said, you see this guy? This is my coach, my first coach, believed in me. He said, Buna, you want to be a pro? You can be a pro. You know why? Because I know what it takes to be a pro. And I didn't have to train the goalkeepers. I usually have three, four, or five at MLK, which is incredible. You know would do it. He was so physically dedicated. It was yeah. crazy. And again, combined with his physical assets. And so when he introduced me, he said about me always supporting him. And that he said, this was my coach. You know what he used to do with me? 
They used to take me to the handball courts, concrete courts, and ask me to dive on the concrete. <laughs> <laughs> and and the kids, you know, the kids, the professionals, they just, uh, they look at me and, and they realize the respect who has for me. And it's, just, it's, it's awesome. It's the yeah. greatest feeling, great feeling. Uh, who's Personally, who's the best goalkeeper you ever trained with at, when you were a player? Oh, my goodness. I, I could <laughs> – we'll have to do another session. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would say Shep Messing, without a doubt. Shep was uh, amazing. I think the only person who had quicker reflexes than me. Really? Shep? Yeah. Shep was amazing. Again, for – with the new league, the New York Arrows out of Long Island – out of Nassau Coliseum, four straight championships. And that was due to the other case. Phenomenal. But I remember afterwards we would get together with the St. Louis steamers. Mm. Each other, you know, and sitting down afterwards before they were traveling back. And I think shh, the arrows won two one and mm -hmm. maybe eight seven. And I remember this player's name was Rome. But he was saying, shaking his head, he said, Mickey, we just couldn't pass Shep. We, we couldn't <laughs> do it. No, Shep, he did it. And here's a guy, not only four champions, but seven and seven. In LA, he won the game. Mick, I'm starting to lose you again. So yeah. he also played for the Cosmos, and they won the uh, NASL championship, 1977. Wow. And an interesting insight. Training with him, Shep was not the kind of guy like Coach Mick to come and do like uh, uh, abdominal work, you know, or yeah. this fingertip push ups. You know, Shep just wanted to compete. I'll compete, I'll save more goals than you. Let's yeah. play uh, errors. You go over there, and I'm pounding the ball to you. If you don't handle it cleanly, you know, whoever handles it more cleanly wins. That's Shep. That's yeah. what <laughs> From a coaching perspective, if you said to Chef, you know, run 16 laps, you know, he's like, nah, yeah. that doesn't work. And then during, I trained those guys during that season. Zoltan, and my magnificent, I like to make up names, Zoltan Toth, mm -hmm. whose father was Hungarian. Big strong guy. He later went on to play in the San Diego Soccer's in the MISL and won championships. And mm -hmm. Chef and I looked at him, and his yeah, you know, like Beesh. but whatever Zoltan did, that that technique that he used, <laughs> it worked. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He he was very special too. And I remember. After after I decided not to work out with them anymore, he said, oh, Mickey, you know, it's it's going to be terrible not having you to work out. <laughs> I've come from the year, years, ancient times, where there were no goalkeeper coaches. Not yeah. like today. You know, every college team has a goalkeeper coach. Every academy has a goalkeeper coach. There were no goalkeeper coaches. They didn't exist. Yeah. And, and the good coaches like Matchnik and Ray Kozeka and, and whatever coach he couldn't train a goalkeeper because he's training and you don't have time for the goalkeeper. So even if you knew about goalkeeping, like Hubert Vogelsinger at Yale, you don't have time to train your goalkeeper. So usually the goalkeeper go by themselves and do whatever they do. Yeah. But I trained, uh, Carlo invited me in 70, 72 to help him train his goalkeeper. You know, if you're asking about goalkeeping. Have to re remark about Dragon Radovic. Hmm. Probably he's Croatian. I'm not sure. Dragon sounds it. But he, you know, he has an itch name. You know, like Modric and all of those guys. This guy was the best technical guy I've ever worked with. Okay. And he went on to play with the Washington Dips with a guy named Johan Cruyff. Oh, okay. And I was able to see him play against the Cosmos. I don't quite remember the outcome of the game. Zero and Dragon was he was a special guy. And interestingly enough, with him, I would show up to training 
and the guys would always make fun. Dragon is injured. Can't train. Why? Why train? You're giving him the day. Too tough. Mickey, you're too strong. <laughs> Mickey did too many things. He wasn't the hardest working guy. Yeah. But, but he had fabulous technique, as John Carlo did. Our yeah. Goalkeeper at Monroe. Fabulous yeah. technique. Listen, Mick, who, who is – so a couple things. One is, who you know how Tony and, and Danny went yeah. on to create yeah. such, you know, change in goalkeeper yes. and goalkeeper coaching? Yes. Who, who – did they get that, you know, their influence from, from Matchnik? Uh, from me. No. <laughs> Danny and I were the first staff of Joe's first team, okay. which was out of Loomis Chafee. Okay. Okay, private school in Connecticut. I know it well. And we only, his first camp had like maybe 40 or 50 kids. And then a few years later, he had thousands of kids in every city in the country. But yes, Danny, that's where I met Danny. Okay. Yeah. okay. And Tony, uh, I played with Tony on the 73 Wildcats, Tony DeChico, who's uh, passed away. And Tony had, he was a big sports star in Connecticut, you know, Football, basketball, whatever, soccer. He had broken his ankle. Mm. So I never really got a chance to uh, work out with Tony. Okay. Yeah. I mean, when I was a little, when I was a young kid, Mick, I actually started out as a goalkeeper. Then I got too bored. But Tony DeChico and Danny Gaspar, I, I had them as instructors, you know, coaches at one of my first soccer camps when I was a little kid. And they were both super nice guys and, and worked us really hard, and it was fun. Um, Mick, who's the best goalkeeper in the world in the last decade? You know what? Before we did this, I knew you were going to ask me these questions. Oh, and man. my goalkeeper list starts with Lev Yash. Look him up. You know, today, Mick, you're always fight. educating me. You find, I'm glad, you find everything you want to know on the YouTube, you know. So I told my grandson, who's a little aspiring goalkeeper, he's 12 now. I yep. said, son, here, Lev Yashin, what do you think? He goes, so, 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 wow. Better, better, than, better than our Italian guy, Buffon. Uh, uh, see, Mick, see, see? You know, if you ask me the best, Wait, started with uh, Yashin. Yep. Yashin was the black spider. I would say he's the godfather of goalkeeping. Oh, okay. He, his diving was phenomenal. His bravery was phenomenal. There is one sequence in the 1966, you know, World Cup yep. in Everton playing against uh, he's Russia, Soviet Union, Germany, and he comes out in the box, you know, between the penalty spot and the top of the box, and he punches the ball. I think he did it twice that game, 40 yards. Mm -hmm. And I watch, I watch these films, of, you know, that are just phenomenal. And, you know, he's the only goalkeeper that won the Ballon d'Or, if I'm not mistaken. Ooh, I did not know that. There you go. So, yes, uh, Buffon is one of my favorite. <laughs> But in terms of dressing, you kind of got that mistaken. I would always carry three, three, teams, three colors of jersey in my bag. It's like a woman who goes to a party. You know, she buys a dress, you know, uh, Ralph Lauren and the other girls wearing the same dress. Like, that's not happening to me. <laughs> if the goalkeeper's wearing green, which was not one of my choice colors, I'm not wearing green. I always had a backup. Oh, God. That so is in those days, in the Wildcats, the first KNVB, yeah. which stands for the Dutch Football Federation, yeah. federated youngest coach was our player coach, mm. Rene Cormans. Mm. And we used to play at Dillon Stadium at, at night. Mm -hmm. And he came over to me one time. I never played a losing game for the Wildcats. Put that mm. in. in uh, okay. I like that. And he came over and he says, Mick. You know, you should wear a fluorescent like they wear today, green or yellow, because there are psychological studies that shooter will shoot at the color. <laughs> it's like deer hunting, yes. Yeah, okay. and I said, you know, Renee, that doesn't work for me. 
<laughs> and and that's in Shep's book. He would say Mickey would be digging through his bag trying to find the appropriate jersey. And for that team, I used to wear brown <laughs> with a little. I used to search around for for jerseys in in various stores that were with a little sun on my left breast, which was yellow and red, and with red shorts and red socks. And I said, you know, coach. I don't want them to know where I am. That's my theory. <laughs> Let them wonder where this guy is. Oh, that's funny. That's mm -hmm. funny, Mick. Yeah. So the yeah. fluorescent colors, when I see these guys wear the fluorescent colors, I just go, really? A lot of the goalkeepers now going to like Yashin, uh, traditional black. Uh, yeah. David De Gea wears black. Yeah. Schmeichel wears black. Yeah. So it's nice to see. You know, things come around. They come around. So, Mick, how, I want to ask you, how did you tell everybody, all the viewers, how you know that Pele likes Caribbean music? When <laughs> he introduced me, he always, you know, he, he likes to, like, say, this guy played with Pele, which is not true. I trained with him because my buddy was Shep, and I helped train Shep. At that time, I think it's 1976, even maybe. At that time, I had shot my hip which is my labrum slightly torn, really hurt me. And uh, I was training room buddies with LA. He was always in the training room. In the Whirlpool, I don't know if they have Whirlpools anymore. <laughs> yeah. The big silver bathtub, you know, with the sun. Yeah. Circulates the water. So Pele and I we, we were always in there. And in those days, I used to carry around these boom boxes. People have a boom box. Mine wasn't a boom box, but I had my Ajax pack my favorite team and uh play that music the uh reggae music which was low beat relaxed me goal keeping is very pressurized tense yeah intense and Pele turns to me and he goes I like your music <laughs> that's great Mick listen and you know what's funny is that so you you would train in the city like obviously you're 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 a Brooklyn guy, New York guy, and you would go to those handball courts, right, and whip that ball against the yeah. handball courts. But you never give it up, did you? You always still go work out, don't you? I lost you for a second. I do. I do. I have my routine, you know, that I've been doing for a hundred years. You know, tossing the ball, always working on my hands, and my level. I played professionally, was always to improve. And like you, I enjoy the game. I read about the game. I used to go down to 42nd Street. There was a famous store, a, a newspaper store, and by Le Keep, which is the sporting newspaper of France, mm -hmm. and uh, AS Madrid, I think, of Spain. And also my favorite was Charles Buchan, uh, Football Monthly. Yeah. And in that... He had the game results of every game you could think of in Europe. National team, uh, Twombly United, you know, in the fourth division. How many people went to the game? Who scored the goals? I was always reading about it. Uh, I didn't need one special thing about goalkeeping is you don't need anybody, you know. I got my ball. I got the wall. Yeah. Do my little training routines. And that's where I used to coach for Martin Jacobson. I was yeah. in Riverside Park doing my little training drills, you know, working on my hands and my uh, flexibility and coordination. He comes over to me in his style. You know, he goes, who are you? Yeah. And I go, I'm uh, Mickey Cohen. You know, he goes, you want to work with me? Yeah. Yeah, why not, man? You know, I live on the other side. And sure enough, uh, I came back to Buna Kandu. That was my first game. And that's... That's amazing, Mick. And obviously, I know we all know Coach Jake, and you know that's that's an amazing program. And obviously, you're a huge part of that program. Uh, and Buna wasn't the only great keeper. You've had so many good. Oh keepers. Oh my goodness! Well, our our you mentioned John Carlo Perez. Yeah, we used to call him Mini Man, He's a boy from Colombia. So when he came to us, like eighth or ninth grade, he was like five foot six. You know, well, I remember. I would 
practiced with him. And then he goes, where did you learn your technique, son? You know, and I can't quite remember the fellow, but in uh, Flushing Meadow Park, Mm -hmm. where you know the homeland of uh, hispanic players and he said i learned it from you know i go Psh, well he did a really good job yeah and then after a year or two mini man became like six foot two yeah yeah and he also won the new york city championship as a goalkeeper and then you took me away from the UK. <laughs> and then the first year yes my goalkeeper Yes, Mick. You know what? I think when you you gotta you gotta get your perfect spot, or else you talk over yes. the mic. And we can't get. Oh it, right? no, we gotta we gotta have this on on uh, tape. Yeah. Don Carlo, my first goalkeeper at Monroe was my former keeper at high school. Yeah. He came. Uh, we played in the final, which we didn't win, and John Carlo was uh, voted first team All American NJCAA. He was great, but I also remember. Malik Fay and Louis Bolton. Oh, and oh yeah. Awesome. I thought that Malik maybe could have been, you know, he, he it, like, I thought he was going to be Senegal's next. Well, if you ask me, like, Mick, who do you think the best goalkeeper in history over the last 10 years is? I would say Malik was the best high school goalkeeper. He was even a uh, higher level than Buna. His technique was better. He was a string bean and he could dive. He won two New York City championships on penalty kicks. He was the winning penalty kick yes. to ice the game. And unfortunately, he went up to a school upstate. And again, APY, first game, he had an uh, encounter, you know, on a, on a come out play, on, on a breakaway, and he broke his leg. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So after that, I don't know really what happened. I, I think he played in tournaments in the summer, but yeah, yeah, he, he was, was really special. He was special. Even just seeing him in his uniform, you look at him and say, "That's a goalkeeper." He was a goalkeeper. He yeah, was terrific. Yeah. yeah, pretty amazing. Uh well, Mick, listen, I, I you know, it, it's funny. Like everybody, I remember when I was down at the summer of soccer, and you came and. You give me the 1970 World Cup tactics and all the trends. Yes. And, the book. and exactly. I appreciate, you know, you always sharing your knowledge with me. And, um, and, and you know, this is one thing that, that, that in soccer, and I speak about this with a lot of coaches, and I spoke about this with Dean Kosky from Lehigh the other, the other day, mm -hmm. about how in soccer, like in baseball and football, mm -hmm. Coaches who have been around and, and mm. have seen everything almost yeah. Yeah. are really valued and their yeah. wisdom is really valued. But somehow in soccer, we don't always value that mm. kind of wisdom. We always look, hey, for the young 26-year-old guy who's got a new idea. Yeah. Yeah. And we tend to overlook, you know, the value and the wisdom in coaches like yourself. And I think that, and you know this, and we spoke about this, you know, you yeah. want to talk about pressing and 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 keeping the ball look look at 1974 right the dutch team like yeah. these are ideas that all sure, come, sure. They come and go and they come and go and hey i got this new thing and then well 30 years ago this team yeah. you know so what, what do you think about that mick you, you I, think I, that you you set me up you set me up i wanted to speak about that the 74 world cup in 74 and 78 the dutch La Machina Naranja, the orange machine, was the best team in the world. And they came up, you know, as runner-up yeah. against Germany, in Germany, and against Argentina in 78, I think was in Argentina. And the first goal against Germany in the final, you can look it up on UT, YouTube, folks, 16 passes. Starting off in the center circle is Cruyff. And 15 passes, he picks up the ball 10, 15 yards in his half, you know, beyond the center circle, dribbles the whole field down the first half. Holland is winning 1-0. Mm. That, that's soccer. That yeah. was, and, you know, you talk about the modern soccer, which is Barcelona and Man City. You know, they play this beautiful style of ball control. 
Well, the Dutch and their clockwork orange were incredible. Yeah. yeah. Everybody running full speed, interchanging positions. Yeah. It was an amazing team. Yeah. Yeah. For the, for the young guys out there, that tends to get lost. We always looked at it started with Barcelona, but it didn't start with Barcelona. No, not at all. Yeah. With uh, the Rina. 70, uh, the World Rina. Cup that you mentioned, you know, my, my, uh, Lost you there, man. Technical. The FIFA committee always does a technical study. That's what you gave me. And on that committee was Detmar Kramer, who coached Bayern Munich, a little old guy. Yes. He came back in 1988 here and was running the, uh, the coaching license, USSF coaching license, right? Yeah. Our, our coaching. And Someone told me, it might have been Arnie Ramirez from LIU, uh, Mickey, are you going to the, the coaching uh, license this year? I go, I don't know, Arnie. It's in Tampa, and Detmar Kramer is there. I said, book me a ticket. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where I got my uh, US SFFA coaching license. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, Mick, listen. If there's anything that that uh, I, I tried to touch on everything with you here, um, anything anything that I missed that you want to mention? Yeah, anything we missed? We covered a lot of ground, which uh, surprised me and pleased me. <laughs> and yeah, you know, when you first invited me, I said, "Wow, you know, I'm talking about 50, 60 years." of soccer and the passion that I have, which is if someone has a passion to play the piano or to be a carpenter or, or to have any skill, it's a blessing and, and a gift. And so sometimes when I come out to the field and I tell the boys, you know, I've been doing this for 50 years. And then I, it's like shocking to myself. Yeah. <laughs> And, and this happened uh, totally unplanned. Yeah. It was, uh, I was on a baseball team at Francis Lewis High School. I grew up in Queens. And the managers were uh, one fellow from England, one from Poland, my favorite Poland. So this was serendipitous. They didn't have a football team, which I was a rugged New York kid. Yeah. So I said, Nick, why don't you play soccer? I said, soccer? What's that? Yeah. As a high school kid, I didn't even know what soccer was. Right, right. And so I started, I, I, in those days, there weren't sports stores. You couldn't walk in and buy a soccer ball. I didn't have a soccer ball. I used right. to take my sister's beach ball out to the front in the projects where I grew up and just run around the grass with the beach ball. That is funny. That is funny. I mean, and that's obviously Francis Lewis High School is always one of the top high schools. And, oh, yes, now. And all, the, and all the top players, you know, in Queens over the years. Yes, true. We don't realize that, the you know, with 12 million people, you know, in, in New York City, you know, it's four times the size of Croatia. There's better yes. be good players hanging around in the melting pot of the world. And, you know, it, it is a – in New York is such an interesting place where people around the country don't realize probably – when you're a soccer coach in New York, you mm -hmm. work with the United Nations. And it's right. what a gift it is to work with kids from literally every country in the world. Yes. And and a soccer experience it is. And and you've been the, the benefit of that. And I've been the benefit of that. And you know, it, it it's good for you. It's it's good for your coaching. It's good for your views on life in general, I think. Well, this is one of the things, you know, if, if you said, you know, Mick, what is, interested you in soccer? You know, you were a baseball player. Why, you know, soccer, something about the nationalness of soccer and blending with guys from all over the world was such a learning experience. And, and it broadens you and it's interesting. People's different outlook, people's different appreciation of music, of food. And that's always intriguing. Yeah, and then and, and you love to travel, Mick, and I love how you go and check out football all over the world. And, I do. Yeah, and that's and that's part of the passion, and that's 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 really really that is awesome, Mick. So 
Listen, and I look forward to the next time we can uh, go get a cup of coffee and speak. Some and oh, no. I recognize it. Arsenal FA Cup jersey goalkeeping. Mick, I can't hear you, but I can see you. This new jersey that the English kids wore is so warm. I love it. And it was given to me by one of the uh, players who we got from, obviously, Arsenal, playing with the Owls in uh, the NISL. And as an honor, he gave this to me. I saw it. Yes, Mick. Prize possession. Prize possession. I've won it for our championships. <laughs> yes, I, Mick, I've seen that jersey worn by you on over like layers of other clothes. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is awesome. Well, listen, Mick, I really appreciate you having you on. And uh, obviously, you, you're going to go back and listen to this episode. <laughs> I am as well. But ho hopefully, you know, people who listen to this mm -hmm. get an idea of, you know, they might have known Danny Gaspar but they probably didn't know Mickey Cohen, but not. Mickey Cohen has brought so much to the game and to the position of goalkeeping and goalkeeping coaching. I, I hope that people can really appreciate, you know, what you've done and, and got a little insight to who you are. And mm -hmm. uh, if they want to reach out to you, Mick, I, you know, I'll, I'll ask you after the show, maybe we'll put some way for them to connect to you in the, in the description under the YouTube uh, link. And, sure. um, uh, you know, you, you never know, Mick, because if I was a goalkeeper coach, mm -hmm. I would want to reach out to you and pick your brain because, you know, and that's that's part of the reason I'm doing the show is to highlight guys like you who are this wonderful wealth of knowledge who really need to be, you know, recognized, you know, a, as the foundation in America of part of this game. So So I appreciate you coming on the show, Mick, and sharing with us everything. I was hoping it would be informative and uh, some history there. And so it was, it was a blast. Thanks, Mick. I appreciate it. Thank you, Coach D.